This is Duke University. Thank you for everyone for inviting me and also agreeing to come this morning to listen to us. Thank you so much. I live on the very bank of the river, uh, maybe 100 meters, my childhood and my present times. I have seen this river, uh, and the river obviously is experiencing an extraordinary political encounter at this moment. The river is a site of great political battle between India and China, India and Bangladesh, and the millions of people who live on this bank of the river. And this was out of this political curiosity. I thought that I must write a biography of a river. Biography does not mean that the river still does not have life. The river still has a post-biography life. So out of that thing, the book uh, almost completed the book. It should be out in the next few months. It's called The Turbulent River, an environmental biography of the Brahmaputra. And the, today's presentation is part of that. I have. There are three characters, the gold wassers, the boatman, and the fisherman. And I thought that they must come live. But unfortunately, given Ling's very intensely passionate and philosophical paper, my paper is really a very plain narrative about the, about the river. Anyway, let me begin in a very conservative style. The Brahmaputra is definitely an offspring of a natural past rather than of a human history. Geological events, rather than the human labor, have shaped its history. Until recently, human did not and could not fundamentally change the river. While embankments have imposed certain constraints, the river has miraculously escaped the domination of the age of technology. Unlike many great rivers of the world, the Indus, the Yellow, the Mekong, the Nile, the Yangtze, the Rhine, the Brahmaputra is still largely untamed, little touched by the powers of dredgers, dynamite, mathematical formulas, dams, and locks. Uh, there are no storage dams on the Brahmaputra to produce electricity, nor has it been subjected to major hydroengineering projects. Stray ideas of a street jacketing the river's braided uh, beds into a single river a uh, single channel were never translated into reality. There has been no large-scale dredging of the river to excavate the river's rising bed. While there are dikes everywhere, the gushing floodwaters of the river break these structures regularly. Only this year I experienced myself one of such devastations. Uh, even now, only parts of the river's long course are witness to concrete houses, roads, and markets. Its banks are still covered with grasses, trees, temporary houses. The Brahmaputra is still deeply embedded in the idea of wilderness, essentially remaining a very, very rural river. Today, the river and its environments are seen as one of the last baston of nature. The Brahmaputra is literally always on the move. Like many other rivers, it is alive, angry, intense, or fickle, sometimes volatile, and at other times peaceful. The river is truly the sculptor of Assam's landscape. The Brahmaputra's historical identity is inescapably connected to both human and the natural actions. The river aptly fits Richard White's description of a river as an organic machine, having limbs, wings, and veins. With this in my mind, the Brahmaputra, I can argue, has a life beyond its waters. In public imagination and its course of official narrative, largely crafted by technocrats, experts, increasingly the river is seen as causing damage to lives and properties. Its waters are being seen as a sinful waste, not being used for the welfare of the Indian nation. A dry river is imagined regularly by the votaries of the Indian development whose new narratives of the river is strikingly a package of the river as a source of great hydro power potential or fulfilling the need of the dry regions of India. This narrative snapped the complex interaction of the humans with the river. Essentially, this river is not often associated with the lives of rands of livelihood practices like gold washers, boatmen, or fishermen. Until not long ago, these artisans profoundly affected the daily life of the river. 
the Brahmaputra, full of water, mud, silt, powerful currents, and blessed by a long spell of monsoon and vastly expansive floodplain ecology, was home to a range of complex yet interlinked artisanal activities. These artisans did not tame the river but had learned to synchronize their craft with the ferocious currents and the impulsive temperament of the river. Their intimacy with the river and their labor on the river was crucial to the making of the pre-modern Assam, polity and economy. All of them understood the river differently. This intimacy did not always pay off. The river was often ruthless, but these artisans survived it for centuries. By the late 19th century, these artisans had either disappeared or had metamorphosed into something else, leaving behind only footprints of their name. My talk explains the art of living with the Brahmaputra in the pre-modern times and explains the pain and the consequences of the transition to a modern time. Uh, my first source of inquiry is the gold washers. You know, the first to disappear was the ancient craft of gold washing. The river of the valley were source of gold in the past. Sands found in the riverbeds were embedded with the gold particles. The separation of these gold particles from sand was an elaborate craft. The Assamese kings derived substantial revenue from gold washing. Source of affluence for the Assamese aristocracy, gold collected from the river sand was, could pay off Assam's trade balance, a balance deficit till the last days of the 18th century. Most early travelers to the region noticed the levies use of gold by the Assamese royal and aristocratic families. Towards the end of the first millennium AD, Ibn Khuradid, the 9th century Arabian geographer, noted that Assam was abounded with gold. The 13th century Turkish conquerors to Assam found numerous gold idols of various size and weights. One can get a more concrete picture of gold washing either after the 7th and 17th century, by which time the craft was firmly controlled by the Assamese kings. An estimated 10,000 to 20,000 people were engaged in this trade in that 17th century. Jean Baptiste Sevillier, the Frenchman who tried to make a fortune in Assam in the middle of the 18th century, was surprised by the display of gold in an otherwise poorly styled house. Sevillier also came across many inhabitants working tirelessly on the riverbank to extract gold from the bottom of the river. This art of gold washing developed over the last two millennium. There is no reliable record for, for when the gold washing began in the valley. But what we know clearly is that those ancient records mentioning gold washing activities and presence of images of Hindu deities made of gold. In the absence of any evidence of import of gold to that reason, plenty of gold in various artisanal products constitute evidence of local extraction of gold in earlier times. The Hindu epic Mahabharata mentions gold washing on the Brahmaputra. By the first century, first century CE, and perhaps prior to that, gold washed from the rivers of Assam were used for gold coins of Bengal. A large proportion of gold obtained on the Brahmaputra and its tributaries came from the degradation of the tertiary rocks. In the upper recess of the Brahmaputra, it was derived from the crystalline rocks. Gold washing in the valley, like elsewhere, was influenced by the climatic and the riverine factors. The craft, the craft definitely took shape as an extraordinary human ability to know the rivers, their currents, and the sands. Localized expertise developed to collect gold sand from the rivers. These artisans had acquired erudite understanding of the rivers and their geomorphology. There are two distinct parts involved in the production of gold, collection and the washing. The actual physical removal of gold from, gold from the sand was a laborious task. It involved spooning, the sifting and of the strainers and the trays made out of bamboo and wood. The next step was processing of filtered gold particles with the help of mercury. Gold washers used their fingers to complete these extremely hazardous stocks. A 7th century text indicates the extraordinary human labor that was needed 
or the gold extraction from the gold dust. The text claims that on an average, an individual could make a tola. Tola is equivalent to 11 gram of gold per annum. This is really a very small quantity. More figures of gold extractions are available for the next centuries. Obviously, compared to the world production of gold, the yield from these rivers was is very, very minute and small. The Phyllis gold panning method resembled practices across South, Southeast Asia. The 16th century Aini Akbari, a Persian text, talks about the similar practices in the rivers of northwestern India too. It was the flow of the rivers which determined the beginning of the cycle of gold washing. In most cases, gold washing occurred in the winter, the lean season of the Brahmaputra and its tributaries. Of the gold washers from different communities, only one community worked immediately after the flooding seasons with the aim of obtaining alluvial gold. Changing hydrological conditions also made it impossible to continue extracting gold from the same place repeatedly. Gold bearing sands, regularly sifted with a sands in the course of the rivers the way Yellow River behaved. Sometimes such places would disappear forever. All this necessitated finding new places each and every year. Variation in the quality of gold sands according to the river geomorphology. The washers living in the forested areas produced better quality of gold than the others who mainly worked on the Brahmaputra sand. Gold washing was then fought with heavy extractive labor and danger, which gradually took its toll on the craft. Hill tribes demanded the gold washers pay regular taxes and the later often paid by, ended by paying little more than one tenth of gold collected. The British East India Company's attention to the valley's gold dust as a tradable item went back to the 1770s. In 1773, Hughes Bailey, the far-sighted English merchant who came to India as a sea captain and would become the company's designated representative in Assam's western frontier in 1787, wrote to Cornwallis, the British Brit, uh, Bengal's governor general, seeking permission to trade with Assam on the gold matters. Since then, the material remained an object of attention for the British East India Company. By the first few decades of the 19th century, the numbers of people working in the rivers by that time were very few. James Matty, a British official posted in Assam, found only a few gold washers. By the middle of the 19th century, these officials began to express their dismay at the dilapidated condition of this craft. One official regretted that gold washing has become an unprofitable craft in Assam, that it has been wholly abandoned. This did not stop the British government from investigating further. Uh, since 1855, the Assam administration began to auction the gold washing rights in several rivers. Most of the buyers were local lower ranked bureaucrats. None belonged to the traditional gold washer families. The auctioning of gold washing right was aimed at fully exploring the river and possibility of full scale investment in this practice. The auction rights were bought for a small amount, but the buyers, mostly the Indian Marwari traders, who advanced credit to these strip washers, extracted as much as possible from the individual washers. The gold washers were also heavily indebted to the traders. The washers were left with barely any profit. Hopes of speculation on gold among the Englishmen in India survived for another few decades in the late 19th century. The government in the 1870s began to advocate private investment in gold washing. Most private speculators belonged to a tiny group of tea planters with no previous experience in mining, who were exploring other possible avenues in the region. Few Europeans began to speculate, but all led to failures. What explains this disappearance of this craft in the valley? James McCarlin, a mining specialist from the Geological Survey of India, with extensive understanding of the economy of gold washing, found the culprits in the British policy of this opening this art to European speculation, the poverty of the gravels, the extortion of the Indian Marwari traders. If these were the apparent reasons, there, were, there was more to this. By now, new economic prospects of other minerals also made their presence felt. 
by 1901, the British investment in the petroleum industry of Assam was around rupees 4.6 million. And Assam was producing 75, 7 million gallons of petroleum annually. Compared to this, the tiny prospect from the gold mining, more profit could be made from the other minerals, which include petroleum, coal, and other stuffs. By the 19th century, the international changes in the gold market due to the discovery of new gold mines, particularly the American West, Australia, and the Southern India, reduced the importance of gold from the Assam rivers. Changing sedimentation and the flood regime also very likely contributed to the uncertainties of gold washing. The Brahmaputra, due to its dramatic geological disruption in the upstream, began to carry more water from the late 18th century. Increased water volume and the consequent annual violent floods took away sand particles that contain gold particles without allowing sand depositions near the debousing point in the plains. Gold washers who never continued their de agrarian dependence now had to permanently fall back upon agriculture. Gold washing is no longer practiced in Brahmaputra. All that remain of the craft are the local names of the river or community along with tiny gold flags in the sands of these rivers. My next subject of inquiry is that of the canoes. Canoes are central to the Brahmaputra for hundreds of years. Assamese folk tales are abound with the images of boats. Boat songs and boat meets are integral to the Brahmaputra's cultural landscape. Such Strong cultural ties are possible only when a society has a profound connection with a particular subject. Human coexistence with the Brahmaputra was made possible with the use of the boats. Boats allowed humans to maneuver their way around the river and its floodplain. Over the centuries, inhabitants of the valley and developed special skills to build boats from the locally available trees. Boat making became an specialized craft. Long, hollow trees were used to construct small boats for everyday use and short trips. Long distance river travel was rarely undertaken. Small tributaries connected the flat plains and the hills. Small canoes easily moved between them, allowing trade to flourish between these discrete geological spaces. The boats brought the people close to the river helped them to make peace with the river, allowed the peasants to carry their produce to faraway places and rescued the valley from a life of isolation. How far back one can trace the use of boats in the valley? It is not exactly clear when the boats in different forms and size began to ply the rivers of Assam. Terracotta figures of canoes dating back to the first millennium BC are tentatively indicative of this early presence of boats. Given the archaeological evidence of boats in the Indian rivers as and elsewhere else, there is little doubt that the boats acted as the most decisive and the earliest instrument in helping man to tame the Brahmaputra. The prevalence of dugout canoes of varying sizes as the principal forms of boats in Brahmaputra points to how they help in the transition from the hills to the floodplains. The availability of tall and hard variety of timber in the hills as probed by the paleobotanical findings, suitable for dugout canals, also reinforces a claim towards early human efforts to make the river navigable. Many inscriptions in the first millennium CE found in the valley directly related to the valley-based rulers frequently refer to the naval wars on the Brahmaputra. These inscriptions also mention names of officials responsible for maintenance of boats. But why boats were central to Assam? The answer lies in the Assam's environmental setting. Uh, was navigating Brahmaputra easy? This surely involved infinite challenges. However, human imaginations and the river's environmental setting gave birth to a certain trajectory of navigation. Most rivers were predominantly rain-fed with a water volume reducing the wa in winter. The Brahmaputra and its tributaries were not favorable for the use of bigger sized boats, particularly the larger ones during the winter. Fortunately, the rainy season was for a longer period from March to October, 
and there was the benefit of westerly winds and the downstream currents. Both men had no access to compass or detailed modern charts of the routes to be followed. Nevertheless, they knew how to measure the depth of the river, while heavy silt in the river ensured that any knowledge of the previous measurement hardly be of any help for his present journey. Moreover, during the rains, the channel changed completely and rapidly. The boatmen were essentially dependent on their instinct and the imagination. Yet, volatile river currents, wheel winds, unstable bank lines, floating timbers, blocking the passages, jungle-infested bank lines ensured that the movement by the boats through most of the rainy season remained unpredictable. The formidable presence of the Brahmaputra and its dense wave of tributaries ensured that boats were a preeminent feature of Assam's landscape. Most families owned small boats to keep them mobile. During floods, a boat was the only source of travel and could be used to take one's household goods to safer places. In the early years of the British rule in the 19th century, a British medical practitioner, D.A. MacLeod, showed during a flood an entire small village shifting onto their boats for a fortnight. A trading town near a trading town on the north bank of the Brahmaputra. Despite significant improvement in the surface transport by the late 19th century, boats remain very much part of the everyday life. The centrality of the boats in the polity and economy of the valley ensured the growth of a professional class of boat makers and boat markets. Boat building emerged a key artisanal industry in several localities based on several factors. Availability of craftsmen, traders who were willing to invest capital, easier access to the timber localities. Boat building skills were available to the wider section of population as this did not require significant investment of capital and technology. Everybody, everyone was maker of their own boat. The craft of boat making involved a, a wide, wide range of work, but of course, one of the most important aspects of was to first catch your tree. Boat makers would select a tree from a wide range of timber from the richly forested landscape of Assam, including a particular tree called Holong. In selecting timber for the construction of boats, boat makers look for durability, freedom from insects, and straightness. Some timbers had an extraordinary capacity to withstand the vagaries of climate and nature. Some protected themselves when in water, and some resisted paste. But despite extraordinary dependence on boats as a mode of communication across the valley, what was noticeable is the limited variety of boats. The British tea planter, naturalist, amateur anthropologist Samuel Peel noted down in minutest detail uh, in an unpublished manuscript, monoscri um, monograph titled The Canals of Assam, written in 1870, The Details of Assamese Canals. Peel observed the various method of boat construction, drew with cases of timbers and dugouts, identified four kinds of boats plying on the Brahmaputra. Holong, which is a large cargo canoes used by the Marsans. Another one, a small dugout canoes that could carry five to six persons, used by fishermen or other villagers for everyday needs. Kelnau, pleasure boat. Marnau, which is used less together for stability and carrying higher capacity goods, primarily by the traders. Within this small range of boats, dugout canoes became the speciality of the valley. They enabled passage through a shallow water and the small streams. The Assamese canoes, one official noted in the 18th century, were remarkably suited for the work they were called on to perform and for overcoming peculiar difficulties of the navigation. Canoes ensured that the rivers were the highways of Assam for at least six months of the year. They helped access various types of water bodies and different levels of water. With their varying capacity to carry weight, canoes came to be recognized as the speciality of the valley. The local communities continuously improved techniques to overcome the challenges thrown up by these small canoes. 
The small size of the boats did not restrict the flow of heavy goods. Early in the 19th century, when bulky cargo, such as the cotton, was brought down the valley, a common practice was to fasten two canoes together, with them transverse beams so that the canoes remained three or four feet apart. By the middle of the 19th century, Assam was Britain, British Empire, Britain's Empire's garden, supplying it with tea, timber, and jute. As this significant volume of trade and commerce could not be carried overland for reasons of inaccessibility, the Brahmaputra and its tributaries became the medium through which these products became part of the global economy. But the things did not go well for the boats. For instance, boats became a source of annoyance for the British tea planters who regarded them as a frail boats against a downstream stream of greater force as one of their primary source of concern. These capitalist ventures did not have to wait for long, as since the middle of the 19th century, steamers. Uh, can you go back to that other boat picture? Are those Chinese? Yes, Chinese, 1830s. 1830s. The boats. Oh, no, no, this, the people. The people. people? Yeah, there's yeah. Chinese yeah. steelmakers who were in Guwahati in, yeah, in 18, 1830, late 1830s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Wow. Oh, this was a negotiation and, and the agreement through which they came. And I found a huge bulk of their negotiations in the Cambridge Library recently. OK, we'll talk about it. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. This, cap yeah, this capitalist pensers did not have to wait for long, as since the middle of the 19th century, steamers began to ply the waters of the Brahmaputra and the railways connected the valley to the Bay of Bengal towards the later decades of the 19th century. This did not mean boats, boats immediately lose, lose out to these machine propelled carriers. They remained central to the local economy. It was only with the arrival of the automobiles in the next century that the surface transport obliterated the centrality of the boats. By the early 20th century, the boat had lost its environmental and economic significance. By the turn of the 19th century, the craft of boat making was the first deteriorating. This loss from the centrality of life, boats, however, continued to remain part of the timber trade and the peasant agriculture. Early in the 21st century, thousands of boats still remain the only form for both the banks of Brahmaputra as well as the, its island to remain connected. In the 20th century, boats were slowly displaced, primarily by the il er er arrival of the elaborate network of surface transport, both in the form of railways and road transport, as I have discussed earlier. There was also a massive decline of timber resources and restriction in their free access by the poor, who would have loved to be still dependent on the boats for their everyday needs. Finally, the river and the land connections which helped boats to remain at the center of human mobility were snapped off due to several factors, as I have discussed. Now, let me come to my last point of inquiry, the world of fish on the floodplains of the Brahmaputra. One does not need to scan the archival records to gauge the rule of fish and the fisheries on the nutritional and the emotional well-being of the valley's inhabitants. Their absence in the archives, however, did not deny that. Deny the varieties of face water fishes available in the rivers, wetlands, and the continuous and seasonal connections to the Brahmaputra and its tributaries, which provided nutrition to millions of in inhabitants. A 1962 survey noted 126 species species in the Brahmaputra River Basin belonging to 26 families, of which 23 species are endemic to the Brahmaputra. Varieties of feces found each and every piece of water bodies ensured that the taste buds of the majority of the population were tuned to the wide range of fish-based recipes. Fishing emerged as a key source of income, but very little profit was made, because of which the only poor or folk were attracted to it as a profession. Professional fishermen were regarded as a socially inferior, at least till into the early 20th century. The fishermen who knew the river, their waters, and the countless 
aquatic spaces so intimately, who listen closely to the voices of the rivers and establish emotional relations with them, were doomed to live a life of misery. In the valley, in spite of the fact that fisher folk were looked down upon, the tactics and the practice of fishing were widely familiar to communities and individuals across class and gender. As fish could be caught not too far away from one's residence, the art of fishing was learned by most irrespective of their gender. I think this is a better <coughs> right. Varieties of fishing nets, variously named fishing instruments, mostly made of bamboo, can, and also occasionally of iron, were used to catch fish. These fishing instruments were suitable for shallower water bodies with slower currents and full of mud and sediments. Most of the equipment, other than the nets, was not meant for large catches. Many of these tools have been immortalized in Assamese literary works. Most fishermen could make these tools on their own, having learned the craft from their parents or village elders. I was also taught how to make this kind of tools. However, what was interesting in this floodplain environment was that instead of deep waters of rivers, people mostly caught fish in the rice fields and a scores of streams connecting these fields with the rivers and the marshy lands. At least well into the 19th century, a large mass of people for whom a little boiled rice, few silage, boiled herbs, a little oil was the only way to satisfy their hunger could add extra nutrition for a small, miserable fish that they caught in the rice fields. For many, agriculture and fishing went hand in hand. Why rice fields were so attractive for fishing? The answer lies in the ecology of fish in the floodplain sitting. During the rains, river, during the rains river fish can swim annually to the smaller rivers for spawning. During rains, the younger fish disperse to the rice fields, swamps, drains, ditches, and as flatworsters retreat, they begin their reverse journey. But the dangers which beset them on the road are more numerous than those Bunyan's pilgrims had to encounter. These dangers were none but only those traps, which you can see it here, placed by the villagers all across the rural watery landscape to catch fish. These traps were imaginative, but not mighty structures. The most common method was to build garden dams supported by tightly knit fences made of sticks from bamboo or reeds. If fishing was an art known to everyone, fish was found everywhere. By the late 20th century, Assam is a major importer of fish. Most of these now come from the farmer's tank of Gangetic belt. What led to the disappearance of fish stocks? Two aspects can be highlighted. The first one is that of the new regime of extraction of rent from the fishermen in the 19th century. While the pre-19th century government imposed tax on the individual fishermen, the imperial government auctioned the highest, to the highest bidders the water bodies on a lease system. The introduction of lease system meant denial of customary rights to thousands of river and inhabitants. Fishermen bound to pay their annual bidding cost aggressively fished in their leased areas. If this practice of auction extracted heavily on the stocks of the fish, the floodplain's fate began to unfold dramatically in the 20th century. Massive expansion of railways, highways, and magments had permanently mutilated the valley's floodplains and deprived the fishes from their June of reproduction making Assam to depend on fish imported from outside the Brahmaputra Basin. At the turn of the 21st century, the Brahmaputra remain as active as earlier, but the river is now seen as a national waste. And Indian planners are constantly at loggerheads with those who desire to prolong the river's wilderness. My examples are probably more than enough to prove a case for an intimate relation between human imagination and a an stormy river which helped a valley to acquire economic power and vitality once upon a time. Thank you. Thank you.